Hello and welcome to the Friday, April 26, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Quick reminder day from Jesse that even on a honeypot, the fireball configuration matters. It's less a matter of blocking or allowing certain ports, but redirecting traffic to appropriate listeners. The honeypot we are using is uh, taking a page here from Kauri, where you are using IP tables in order to redirect traffic uh, to individual ports. If you have things like Kauri and our web honeypot listening on, that way, if the firewall rules are not configured correctly, you may miss quite a bit of traffic, and that's what Jesse observed in his Azure cloud-based honeypot. Black X is a little bit older botnet originally uh, coming out in 2020. In March 2023, Sophos wrote about it and it had a couple interesting properties. One was that it's one of those bots that actually propagates over USB sticks. So if you connect a USB stick to an infected system, it copies itself and then uh, could potentially be launched on a new system as the USB stick is being moved. Now, as of uh, late last year, this botnet was really sort of considered somewhat dead because it only communicated with one specific IP address as a command control server. Well, it turns out that Sequoia has taken over that IP address. It was hosted with uh, Green Cloud, so they pretty much just set up an account with them and had themselves assign this IP address. And since September last year, they're using it as a sinkhole to basically learn more about this particular botnet. Sadly, it always happens that uh, there are still uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of systems infected by this somewhat older uh, worm. And uh, Sequoia now also discovered a little weakness in the command and control protocol used by BlackX that theoretically allows Sequoia to uninstall this particular worm. That, of course, puts up a whole set of ethical questions. And Sequoia sort of has a interesting approach to uh, kind of deal with that. They're now offering national law enforcement agencies the ability to essentially launch uh, these uh, uninstalled commands. We have seen this in a couple cases before here in the US where the FBI uh, got uh, court orders that allowed them then uh, to uh, send these uninstalled commands just, uh, I think it was earlier this year uh, with some of the router malware uh, that uh, where they actually uh, performed such an, a takedown, not just on the command control server side, but also on the infected uh, host side. We'll see uh, what happens with this interesting approach to sort of reach out uh, to basically individual countries, law enforcement agencies to deal with it in a legal manner typically involving some kind of a court order. But of course, the exact procedures will vary widely depending on the country that is engaging here with Sequoia, if they actually do. And open source firewalls are not free of vulnerabilities either. There is an update for PFSense that fixes four different vulnerabilities. Three of them are cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. The fourth one is a local file include vulnerability. A little bit hard to tell from the description how exploitable they are, but definitely something that you do want to patch. And GitLab also released an update. This one fixes five different vulnerabilities. The one with the highest CVSS score, 8.5, is a path traversal attack, but apparently only leads to a denial of service. And uh, one bug that sounds kind of interesting, and uh, that uh, relates to Bitbucket. If you set up a connection between a Bitbucket and your GitLab instance, it's possible an attacker who has one of your users' uh, Bitbucket credentials could take over another user's uh, GitLab account. So not exactly sure how this works, but well, OAuth sometimes works in mysterious ways. 
And well, we do have another science.edu student for our Friday podcast. Matthew L. Morhees is joining me here. Uh, Matthew, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, Matthew Voorhees. Uh, I currently work at a company called Medtronic. We develop and uh, market medical devices, uh, regulated medical devices around the world. And we're, we're one of the, the larger players in the industry. Um, the, the group I work in is is a bit unique uh, from traditional enterprise uh, IT security. The, the group I work in is regulated medical device and uh, regulated medical device software security. Um, so we typically deal with uh, non-traditional uh, computing systems and software and, and how to secure those uh, while also providing kind of therapeutic benefit um, within the expectations of, of customers, which are kind of hospitals and clinics, uh, as well as regulators um, like the United States FDA uh, that authorizes many of our products um, to be sold on the market. Um, so that's Medtronic and, and the, the group I work in, I've been part of the topic of regulated medical device cybersecurity for almost uh, eight years now. Um, and it's, it's kind of been, been a relatively new um, topic in, in our industry that really started around 2015 timeframe. Um, but the, the focus of my kind of research paper that we'll chat about here uh, is really on kind of preventative controls um, because that is uh, a larger focus uh, for, for regulated medical device security, uh, maybe more so than, than other computers that are more general purpose um, that are within the general uh, IT enterprise. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I dived into uh, because that's what we're kind of restricted to, uh, to work with in, in most medical devices that aren't connected to a network or the internet. And that's a, sort of really the interesting part of the paper. I think I had at least one student uh, on the podcast that talked about detecting uh, living off the land yeah. attacks. And that's how it's yeah. usually being approached, kind of as something yeah. that's inevitable. Uh, yes, you mm -hmm. know, command.exe, ping, they are on the system. <laughs> Hard to remove them. Maybe ping you could theoretically remove. I'm not sure what they would break. Yeah. Something would probably break if you remove ping. So you really more look for, is it abused? Is it used in any odd ways? But you actually try to look at how can you block usage. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about the approaches yeah. that you tried there? What worked, what didn't work? Yeah, as I was trying to think of a topic for research, it was around the time that uh, Vault Typhoon report was issued by kind of the, the five eyes and governmental agencies, as well as Microsoft. And and. One kind of keystone in that report was this idea of living off the land binaries. And, and this topic had been around for a number of years in our industry, but um, this was one of the first kind of big reports of it being used as a principal uh, kind of tactic by threat actors um, to, to great success, right? So I think it kind of renewed interest in the topic, but also if you look at that report, they're not doing like complex things. They're not using like lull bins as they're called um, that are unknown or obscure, right? It, it's it's kind of traditional ones, right? Um, which is, is just kind of blows my mind a bit um, in, in the year 2023, 2024, right? Uh, when this research was done. So I think it also um, allowed me to take a step back and, and think that when we were back doing prevention of lull bins years back. Um, we didn't have the prevalence um, of software as a solution um, uh, technology. And over the years, over the last kind of four or five years, um, there's been a growing theme of, of the web browsers, the new operating system, uh, because frankly, a lot of, kind of just general workaday uh, activities for just a, a usual enterprise employee are really done within the web browser or basically the Microsoft suite of applications uh, for Office. And kind of the, the combination of, of that kind of relatively new paradigm of lack of thick client applications for most workaday app, um, usage by enterprise groups, um, as well in combination with kind of Wolben's 
being used by threat actors, but not really obscure lull bins led me to kind of the, the point of this research that I did, which was understanding if we could create some profiles of traditional enterprise users based on kind of their work tasks that they need to get done. Um, and then actually testing like, hey, is it actually possible to disable some of these traditional albins like WMIC or even ping and, and still having these kind of workaday applications on the thick client side, as well as operations and the web browser really not be impaired, right? And, and I think the new technology that we've kind of uh, had had opened up to us through certain vendors, including Microsoft, allows execution of those old bins for specific applications, right, that we trust. And if we can set established baselines of trusted applications in the beginning, um, the the friction that's created from disallowing usage of those all bins outside of those trusted applications uh, really, really goes down. Right. And, and I think the research that I have in my paper kind of at least proves that out in, in some application, right. In, in kind of initial um, tests that were done and generic user profiles that were created for uh, technical users uh, that use a lot of the client applications for like code development, but also for, general um i or general enterprise users as well how do custom sort of fat clients fit in there like not familiar sort of with the medical device stuff but i've seen sort of in insurances where you have these weird like wrappers around telnet to connect to a uh, to a mainframe or something like that mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. would they sort of fit into that model so as I kind of thought about this, and this is a little bit in my paper too, but not as um, acute or apparent, I would say, is if you look at your just whole group of employees, and we're, we're just focused on workstations for this research as well, we didn't really look at servers, but if you look at your full population of employees, there's a very small percentage of those employees that probably use PowerShell. And there's a very small percentage that probably use command line, right? Like most people don't need access to those utilities for for their day job. They need email, they need Teams, they need Zoom. Like they, they don't need a lot of things. So you can really kind of isolate your risk for those unique employees that you mentioned that might need that middleware stuff that maybe is is running on on their computer or even like a server that might need middleware stuff to operate. Um, like if you can burn down the risk of allowing 100% of your employees access to all these utilities that they're never going to use down to maybe 10% of the employees that might need them once a year, right? Like that burns down a lot of risk very quickly especially if you adopt kind of the allow list and deny list approach that I um, recommended in my, in my research paper um, to, to make sure that work can still be executed, but you're, you're shrinking down the attack surface of, of what malicious programs and threat actors can execute on a workstation uh, significantly. Right. And, it, and it's a defense in depth approach that you're not going to, you're not going to, remove all risk, right? You're, you're definitely going to prevent the execution of, of workaday um, kind of malware and, and malicious programs through what you're able to do through hardening of, of allow listing and deny listing application control approaches. Um, but that still, at the end of the day, saves a lot of time and energy for incident response um, and, and working incidents because you don't want them to be spending their time on opens, right? You want them to be spending their time on more value add activities. And, and really this helps at the end of the day, reduce that noise that's created in the enterprise for detection of a lot of this stuff and really focuses the time and energy of, of those responders on, on things that truly do matter, right? Um, that, that do, that are worth their time and investment. Yeah, so an attacker gaining access to a machine and attempting to execute one of those blocked uh, low bins, would they still trigger an alert or would they just not be able to execute it? 
Yep. So, so we're strictly kind of talking about Windows right now um, mm -hmm. and the research I did, but I mean, it still gets logged in, in Windows logs, um, which would go to a seam or, or some kind of monitoring solution, right? Where it would block it, but it would also note that it blocked it and what it blocked and kind of the parent child relationship with what it blocked and when it blocked and works like you get all that information still, uh, which is valuable to be aware um, that something was blocked because Susan, who's never opened up cmd.exe in the 15 years she's worked at the company, just executed WMIC from a command prompt like that. Yeah. That's never happened in almost two decades. And you want that, that's an anomalous behavior you want to, might want to look yeah. into, even if it prevented the initial um, kind of uh, approach for the threat actor, right? Um, so there is still value in, in detection and response, but it's more focused then, right? Like, you know that you, you've you probably dodged the first bullet, but that doesn't mean you don't want to investigate and make sure that they don't try something different or don't enumerate your deny list <laughs> to find one. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, that, kind that of. You want to use, know right? that they, you, you want to know that they enumerate the deny list. So hopefully yep. you'll stop them before they found something that you forgot kind of or exactly. that you still had to yeah. have enabled. H have you attempted, uh, aside from the research paper, to implement that at the organization yet? Or? Yeah, so I mean, in the context of regulated medical devices, it's a very difficult uh, problem um, because they're providing therapeutic benefit and we can't really use availability. Denial of availability is a control because uh, that's that's a safety risk. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have to get creative, right? But the silver lining is, is that we are not building general purpose computers. We are building computers that are designed to do a couple things very well in a very predictable way. And like you can carve around capabilities of, of a computer to do a few things very well, very predictably um, through approaches like application control and allow list and deny list to, to very tuned degree nowadays. Um, so we, we certainly do kind of apply that approach and in, in principles to uh, most of our medical devices that are not embedded um, systems, right, that aren't running on real-time operating systems or really thin pieces of of uh, footprint uh, firmware, right? The the bigger iron devices we like to think about yeah. um, that, that have a large footprint physically uh, generally are running on Windows or Linux or kind of a combination of both if it has few computers. So uh, that that's definitely kind of a tried and true approach that we're able to leverage within medical device security for certain medical devices. Um, now within the IT security enterprise we, we have here, I'm less involved with that side of the operations, right? Um, so I'm not as familiar um, with, with their application control approaches that they've implemented uh, through their tool suite, but from a regulated medical device side, uh, certainly an approach we implement. And I would think that, and you mentioned availability, that one of the selling points could be that system is more stable if you remove some of the unnecessary junk from it. You know? Totally. Yeah. I mean, it goes it goes back to kind of basic cybersecurity principles, right? If you're never going to use it or need it, it's a tax surface that can be leveraged. Um, so the, the best kind of control response is, is removal, right? Um, so there, there's a lot of effort done at the beginning of, of a project um, that leverages commercial operating systems to remove that attack surface um, and, and really truly harden the image of the operating system just down to what you need. Um, a little more expansive, like we have to do software build materials for our uh, medical devices and software now, right? So if you're listing out all of the components in your software build materials, um, that is also a good gut check to say like, I actually don't need all that stuff because we don't yeah. leverage any of those libraries or any of those utilities. Like the, it, it's a good validation of like going down literally the list and saying, is this important? Is this really important? It isn't important. We never use it. Get rid of it actually. Yeah. Um, so that, that is also a good gut check for us in, in this realm of application control and, and hardening. Yeah. Thank you uh, for joining me here. And, uh, 
where are you in your program? Are you done now or still have a class left? Um, it is really funny, actually. Um, I've been in, I'm in my last class and I submitted my last assignment, but it hasn't been graded yet. So I have no more work to do, but I'm technically not complete. <laughs> I'm in the purgatory realm right now, but um, I really appreciate the opportunity um, and, and frankly, the support from the Sands Institute to, to really do my, my first kind of academic research um, and, and spread my wings a little bit. Yeah, thanks. And I have to check my inbox if your paper is uh, waiting there for a grade. <laughs> there <we> go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. And uh, well, uh, thanks everybody for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.